this idea of um, ETH as an internet bond as a productive asset that can be used in other chains uh, to power other applications. I know there's been a lot of uh, just, I, I would say, latent conversations like sitting in the background about restaking and eigenlayer and that kind of thing. What's your take on this internet bond meme and this property of um, ETH as a yield bearing asset uh, collateral maybe going into 2024? Do you, do you think that is powerful? Do you think that is something that can resurrect the narrative power and actually fundamentals of ETH? I mean, I think that is the biggest narrative and meme that we really have within the community. And to go back to what Mike was saying about, you know, him not liking the ultrasound money meme, I think in the Ethereum community, we have this tendency to create these insider memes that just get out of control, right? I always felt like the ultrasound money thing was an insider Ethereum thing that we made for ourselves to poke a little bit of fun at Bitcoiners, right? But of course, memes have take on a life of their own and they go way crazier than you think they're going to go. And we've done this with other things, right? With like the Ethereum alignment meme meme. Like that just is not anything that should be taken seriously. It is an insider thing that we talk about um, amongst ourselves. But because we do it publicly and because we speak about it on Twitter and podcasts and because it's easy to poke fun at, right? The ultrasound money memes, easy to poke fun at. The alignment stuff is, it just goes much further than than we can basically uh, uh, can control. And that leads to bad narratives forming and that leads to people making fun of Ethereum. And I think that's why Ethereum is always kind of uh, in that spot. And I, and I will agree also with the earlier points made around the fact fact that Ethereum has always sat in the middle, I think, between Bitcoin on one end and all the other layer ones on the other end, because Ethereum is competing with all of that, or at least tries to. Like, I think ETH is competing with BTC. Um, you know, people disagree with me on that, but I think it is. And obviously, Ethereum as a platform is trying to compete with the other layer ones as well. But I think, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, Ethereum's competition as a platform has actually shifted to the L2s, right? Because we, we're using the L2s as kind of the execution layer and L1 as a settlement layer. So we've shifted that. But that is a thing that's going to take a while to play out because we've now shifted basically uh, what Ethereum was uh, to what we want it to be and what we think it's it's best to be. But that takes time for the network effects to catch up, for everyone to understand that, for all the complexities to be abstracted away, right? Like the interoperability and the fragmentation, those sorts of things. They're all going to get solved. They're all just engineering issues to me. But you know, over the short to medium term, they're not going to get solved. They're not going to be seamless. And that's going to be a, a narrative point for not just uh, the other layer ones to hit on us about, but also for the Bitcoiners as well, because now they have things like ordinals and now suddenly they're incentivized to pump ordinals and say, oh, we can do NFTs on Bitcoin now. We don't need Ethereum. So Ethereum's always in this kind of middle ground where uh, everyone around us basically is competing with us. And I wouldn't say they hate us, but they're going to obviously not talk favorably about Ethereum if they're trying to promote their own thing. Um, and I don't think that's, as I said, a new phenomenon. It's been around for a while, but I'll circle back to the point around ETH being that kind of internet bond uh, and, and appealing to those more TradFi folks. I, I, I've heard this from a lot of people, honestly, and, and a lot of smart people have said the same thing, that uh, yeah, TradFi is obsessed with yield. You know, in crypto, I don't think people understand how obsessed TradFi is with yield because in crypto, people look at yield like, ah, oh, I can get 5% on my ETH or I can go degen into this dog coin and make 100X, right? Because it's, it's just like a lot of degens that are crypto natives. Uh, but there are a lot of people who care about that yield. I mean, there is a lot of ETH staked uh, and I think uh, people look at the amount of ETH staking like, oh, it's not as much as other chains. And it's because ETH is used for much more than, than staking. But of the ETH that is staked, they're earning a real yield from, uh, obviously there's the inflationary rewards, but then there's the real yield from the network activity, right? The MEV and the tips that are going to these stakers. So people are using uh, this already within, within crypto. But I think, yeah, as I said, like crypto natives tend to vastly underestimate how popular yield is in the TradFi world. And just for, for everyday people, you know, everyday people don't want to be a degen and don't want to sit on their computer throwing money at random things and hoping to score it big, right? Uh, and, you know, people do that in, in real life, like in casinos, but it's not like an everyday thing. You don't, you know, most people don't go to the casino with their life savings and like, I'm going to put a, you know, I'll put it all on black and we'll see how we go. But yeah, there's that disconnect. But as we progress into 2024, as we get the ETF, right, as ETH continues to integrate with the traditional finance system and becomes kind of that, that asset, that breakaway asset, as um as it was put before, where BTC and ETH are the only things that are there right now, uh, uh, ETH stands on its own uh, because BTC doesn't offer a yield, right? Because it is proof of work. So ETH really stands on its own in that arena. Uh, and I think that is a huge narrative that we actually need to be leaning into more because I feel like a lot of Ethereum natives, 
they're stuck in like the crypto native uh, 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 memes and narratives and they're forgetting about the fact that we've actually graduated from that. It's like we're still thinking we're in high school, but we're actually in college now and we should we should be focusing on that. We shouldn't be trying to impress the high school kids. We need to impress the college kids, oh, wow. right? So we've actually, that's that's a, that's a problem I, I, I will actually say is that we, we're still stuck trying to, in high school, I, we should be in college with I, BTC. I, I, Anthony, I see you as one of um, Ethereum's most effective educators and, and communicators, uh, really. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about kind of that that narrative, because here, here's maybe um, it's kind of a setup uh, that I have or an idea I have. I think that um, we are stuck in high school and Ethereum narratives are stuck in high school. And I think that um, basically memes have sort of a shelf life to them. And ultrasound money was fantastic coming out of like 2019, 2020, where the popular narrative was ETH is gas and has no monetary policy, right? But like maybe its shelf life has kind of expired and maybe the Ethereum community needs to move more towards this internet bond type of motif. But I'll tell you something else that I, I see is happening in the background is uh, Ethereum itself has shifted from an execution chain to a settlement chain for other chains. And that mm -hmm. is totally different than other points in the cycle. So one of the things that I've seen is basically when somebody comes into crypto, it used to be 2019, 2020, they want to use some cool DeFi stuff. Their first spot is the Ethereum mainnet, right? They spin up MetaMask and they start using the Ethereum mainnet. Now that's no longer the case, all right? And people in the Ethereum community wouldn't even point them to mainnet. People in the Ethereum community would be like, go pick your favorite L2. And we've got Arbitrum and Optimism and Polygon and ZK Sync and all of these different brands and names. So there's kind of like some, some fracturing, it seems mm -hmm. like. And then also, I think I've underestimated previously as an ETHBOL myself, the effect of somebody coming to a chain and then they just buy the local asset of that chain. Why? Not necessarily for use in gas. They're just like, this, this shit's cool. I want to own mm -hmm. some of the native uh, token of this protocol. And they're no longer doing that on Ethereum. Because when they get to Ethereum, they see a $30 gas fee. And they're like, what is this? Like, what mm -hmm. is this? I'll, I'll go to, to Solana. And I think previously I have underestimated that effect. So this is part of this. There, there's a twofold pivot here. There's one, it's the pivot of Ether moving from kind of like an ultrasound money type of motif to an internet bond type of motif. And I still want to talk about how that plays out in its maximum form in 2024. But there's also a pivot on the network layer of Ethereum moving from a, an execution layer for end users. And it's really, let's call it what it is. It's now it's a whale chain. Now it's a settlement layer for other chains effectively. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that and reflect on, on that pivot? Do you, uh, do, you, do you see how that's been harmful uh, over the past few months with, with respect to ETH's narrative and different than it has been in the past. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, so there's a, there's a few things to unpack there. I think that the first thing I'll touch on is that kind of uh, shift in in narrative around kind of Ethereum and and that kind of shift from Ethereum being the execution layer to, to that kind of settlement layer there, right? Where essentially, as you said, people no longer go to the Ethereum main chain uh, because, I mean, one, no one's going to tell them to go there because uh, unless you're, as I said, a whale or someone that can afford it, uh, which is not most people, they should not be going there. And at the same time, if we want to... Uh, make Ethereum a chain of chains or a settlement layer for other chains, then we should be encouraging people obviously to go to those L2s. Um, and, and then you spoke about like people buying the native asset of those of those kind of chains that they go to, whether it's an L2 or something else. And I actually wrote about this a long time ago in my newsletter and I called them shelling point assets. So, you know, you have a shelling point of that ecosystem. So if you go to Solana, you buy Sol, right? Because that is, even if it doesn't even make any sense from an investment perspective, it doesn't matter, right? You're using Solana, you buy Sol, not just to obviously pay for fees, the fees are really cheap so you don't actually need much but you buy it because you're like oh well i'm on solana i'm having fun you know this seems cool i'm going to buy soul because if solana does well i think soul is going to do well right mm -hmm. or then you know you go to these l2s but the l2s i think are a little bit different i i, I think the l2s are using like ether's gas right they're using uh, for, for gas fees they're using ether's money eth is like the base money asset of that ecosystem to use as collateral it's accepted everywhere on all the DeFi apps right so ETH is still seen i think as the, the shelling point asset for those ecosystems but then 
then it becomes that kind of open question around, okay, well, what happens when these L2s start using their native token as gas? Like I know David had a tweet the other day about how StarkNet is actually going to be using Star their Stark token as a gas token. Okay, then do people suddenly think to themselves, well, I should just buy Stark because uh, I'm using it as the gas token and it's, it's, it's the shelling point asset for this ecosystem. But then you can go even further down that curve and say, well, in, in, the, in the end, everything's just going to be able to be paid. Uh, sorry, you're, you're going to be able to pay for gas fees in really any token. It's just going to be abstracted away from the end user. So uh, people will probably pay mostly in stable coins at that point, because that's just the most obvious thing for you to do. If you want to pay for fees, you're not going to go speculate on some token. You're just going to buy stable coins, have them in your wallet, and you'll pay for fees that way. So I think that it's, there's a lot of open questions around that about, okay, what asset are people going to buy when they go to different chains? And it was said earlier that uh, in, in Solana, they're not even viewing Sol as kind of money or as like an asset that should even accrue value. At least the founder is, and I'm sure a lot of the people on there are as well. So I don't actually think we have answers for those yet. We're just going to have to see how it plays out in, in the coming years. But I still think that the strongest uh, point is that if the asset is used as money within that ecosystem, it doesn't have to be necessarily used as gas fees, because as I said, that, that's probably going to be abstracted away, but it's used as money in that ecosystem within DeFi as collateral. Obviously, ETH is great collateral because it has a really high market cap. It's accepted everywhere, you know, it's good liquidity profile, all those sorts of things. So I think that all plays in on of its in of itself uh, and what gives a ETH, obviously a lot of strength and a lot of staying power and people want to hold ETH as well because they're using it in in that way, even if they aren't using it for to, to pay gas fees. And on the L2 point as well, like even if you're not using it to pay gas fees, you still have to settle to L1, which does use ETH to pay gas fees, which goes back to, we were saying, you know, ultrasound money, it makes ETH deflationary, those, those sorts of properties. And on that note as well, there was one other thing I wanted to say before about how um, you, you, you said that we maybe should move forward from the ultrasound money meme. And I actually agree with this because we know we, we made up this meme in like 2019, 2020, because we wanted to prove to the world that ETH was a investable asset. We wanted to prove to the world that ETH was a strong asset, that it would accrue value and that it wasn't just some shit coin that, you know, had its cycle and now no one's going to buy it again. But we don't have to prove that anymore. Even yeah. though, though the narrative over the last few months has been bad for Ethereum and ETH, right? I mean, ETH is still almost a, almost a $300 billion asset. I mean, if you want to do market cap comparisons here, ETH can double and like quadruple or triple Solana's whole market cap from just from just doubling, right? And Sol has already done like a 10, 10X or whatever from the bottom if you want to do relative comparisons. So people tend to forget just how big ETH is as an asset. Obviously, it's not as big as Bitcoin, but because it's that big, as I said, I don't think we need to prove that anymore. So we can move past that. And, and as I said before, we can graduate to now, okay, everyone knows that ETH is a, is a great asset. Well, not everyone, but like... Like people generally believe ETH is a great asset. It's investable. It's it's number two, uh, and it has all these interesting properties. So, what do the 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 new money? What are the new money interested in? What is the new money interested in? The money that's going to be coming in via the ETFs and stuff like that. Well, they're interested in yield. Okay, so let's start promoting that instead of falling back on ultrasound money, which literally means nothing to these people at all. Like even <laughs> so, like it means absolutely nothing, right? So th that meme is not going to hit with them at all. Uh, and uh, it, it and I think even the the, the term sound money isn't but yield right yield is going to hit with them yield everyone knows what yield is <laughs> all right so we so we got to do a, an episode with justin drake and ask him to rebrand to uh, internet money or internet <laughs> he's bond, not gonna like me if he but i just said then <laughs> <laughs> sorry justin. to continue leveling up your crypto game then you need to get on the bankless newsletter it's the world's most popular crypto email and it's completely free just click below to sign up